Yeah. Okay, thanks for the introduction. Yeah, um, as Karin said, I'm, uh, I have a dual appointment in chemistry and engineering, and you might wonder if that makes sense or not. So I will show you uh, how it works. <laughs> So I actually started here at FAU uh, this August. So my lab is really, really new. So most of the stuff I'm showing you right now is, is from my previous research, but I think you will get the idea of what I'm doing. Oops. So uh, I think a lot of people notice that I have an accent in English. <laughs> so <laughs> this is why, and everybody asks me, where are you from? <laughs> so I thought, I try to show you a map of Europe and show you where I'm from exactly. So uh, here I'm from Germany and from a city called Essen. So it's around half a million inhabitants. And it's like essen Kettwig, that's a specific part of Essen. So that's my hometown. <laughs> and I was actually also traveling a little bit. So I, during my masters I also did or I spent a semester or eight months in Spain, so some of you might know Spanish, so I also know Spanish. So, um, and after that, I actually moved to Zurich in Switzerland. So you've seen, you see, I traveled a lot over Europe, and I can highly recommend that to you uh, if you're a student. So do some exchange semesters abroad, so I think it's a very good experience. So a little bit about my research. So I would say a lot of what I d I'm doing here is a little bit of bio-inspiration. So I try to learn from nature. So you see here some examples of sort of called mineralized hierarchical materials. So for instance, our own bone or here lobster cuticles or mother of pearl. What all of those have in common is that there is an organic framework so organic scaffolds, something like collagen or chitin or cellulose, and you have an inorganic mineral. So like, like our bones, for instance, or our teeth would have hydroxyapatite, so that's in calcium phosphate. And yeah, what is fascinating about all of those is that if you combine those two elements, something organic, something inorganic, you uh, achieve much better mechanical properties as with the individual parts. And that's a little bit the inspiration for what I'm doing. So you try to make hybrid composites based on some sort of organic scaffold that has also some three-dimensional structure and combine it with inorganic minerals to reinforce, so to say. And I work pretty much on, on different parts. I think this is why I'm both in chemistry and in engineering, because a part of my research is about understanding biological systems. So that really means going out there and getting real bio biological samples, such as um, yeah, human teeth. These ones are planktonic organisms. So I also went ahead to the ocean, went on a scientific cruise and <laughs> collected these little planktonic organisms and did all kinds of different yeah, yeah, research techniques on them. So that is one thing that we try to understand biological systems. And then once we understood them, we also try to fabricate bio-inspired composites. So and ba but based on similar ingredients, so to say. We also get take something organic, often uh, organic scaffolds that already exist, because I like the idea we don't have to do it again. It already exists in nature. We can just take it and then uh, chemically modify it. So we use our magic in the lab and then improve the properties. So for instance, this is a showcase house in Switzerland. So what is actually also nice about this kind of research is that there might be some real world applications pretty soon. So uh, sometimes it happens that you have a chemical modification and just two years after that, you can already build a house from it. <laughs> so it is uh, maybe in like biomedical research or medicine in general, uh, it takes a lot of time. Uh, you have to run a million different tests. It takes 10 years. And in this kind of applications, let's say for, for civil engineering or environmental applications, you can once, if it's a good idea and not too expensive, you can go ahead and do it. So 
And another thing I'm very interested in is using a lot of different methods. I think some people have a nail and try or uh, try to find a hammer for it, something like this. And I really try to do, use a toolbox of different methods. So both for characterizing macroscopic properties, but also very like microscopic nanoscale properties and use all kinds of different microscopic techniques uh, with electrons, with Raman. So this is like use, looking at molecules really or looking at the elements or the atoms. So everything is pretty much on a small scale. So to so give you some ideas, so, um, so from my previous research, that was, for instance, um, yeah, formation of minerals within a wood structure. So I give you just two examples. One is with iron oxide, so magnetic particles, and the second one is calcium carbonate. So we start with the iron oxide. So here, I actually also have a bit. Oh, oh. Uh, so, so here I. Hope. So here, that is a magnetic wood cube, and this arrow indicates the direction of the wood fiber direction. And as you see, I approach it with a magnet, and it always turns in the direction of the wood fibers. So now, of course, we were wondering where does that come from, that, that we have a so-called magnetic anisotropy. So that means that the magnetization depends on the direction of our macroscopic uh, structure. So then we... And we tried, so one of the methods, I tried to really just quickly explain it to you. It is called Raman microscopy. So we would have a laser, scan it over a surface, and we, we collect some spectra at each and every point as we do that. And the good thing is what we practically do is we see the distribution of molecules, in short. <laughs> so that, uh, and that's a very, very powerful technique. So now for this magnetic wood, what does that mean? So on the left side here, that is electron microscopy. So we would use electrons instead of normal light to create an image. And here you see that these are wood cell cells and we form iron oxide particles only at these interfaces of those cells. And actually they are all very, very small, but a lot of them. So, and this Raman microscopy, so Raman microscopy, for instance, on the left side you would see how a cell looks like, and on the right side you would see this iron oxide. So it is extremely powerful because it's not an image based on just the optics. It really tells you something about the chemistry of your material. So here, the second part had a different application. So that was calcium carbonate. You might know that as limestone. So sometimes you have whole cliffs that are more mostly white colored. Uh, and uh, so that would be the same type of material in here. So here, Again, a video. Wow. Sorry, guys, it's, uh, it's really tricky. So here, the application of this calcium carbonate and uh, wood composites was to increase the fire resistance of those type of composites. And you see just as just at a first glance, you see that in the unmodified samples, you would may have much higher flames uh, than in the modified ones. So this kind of material can be applied yeah, for building houses, building furniture, uh, all kinds of things. So I think that is uh, yeah, clear that it's, it's good to have something that is less fire. Uh, um, yeah. So actually then, oh. 
I told you that I also worked with a marine planktonic organism and collected it myself. So this is how it would look like in 3D. So it, um, it actually is a biomineral, so similar to our bones or, or teeth. So just that this little organism forms uh, the skeleton from strontium sulfate, so it's a different type of biomineral. And this is, so it, uh, the little organism is actually known for quite a while. You see in 1904 they already drew pictures, but apart from those pictures, there's really very little known about them. And I thought it, it makes sense to go ahead and do some more research on it, also learn more about this material. So it's a planktonic organism, it's ubiquitous all over the world. So matter, no matter where you go in, in the ocean, you will find them both in the, in the Arctic Circle and also in the tropics, like here. Um, yeah, and there's, there's a lot of interesting things about it. I can tell you more later on if you're interested. So one more application or one more investigation of those. So what I told you, I'm interested also in those advanced methods. So for this one, for instance, I went to a synchrotron that is in very high, yeah, a national lab, a very cutting edge facility. And this is called, an, yeah, it's a nanoscale elemental map of a single cell. So what you see here, this, you see the scale bar, so this is extremely small. It is just one cell. And this type of mapping pretty much gives you the elemental composition at each and every point. So what we can do here, uh, so you, here you see all these elements there, and then we can identify different types of structures and say, uh, yeah, what type of, how much calcium do we have in there, how much copper, how much zinc, how much uh, whatever you, we want to do, chloride. Um, and we can learn about these nanoscopic biological structures like here, this is a nucleus or this is a cell membrane. So we can learn about all of those and figure out the elemental composition. And I just want to show you that to you that they're really very advanced methods and I think it really provides us additional information in biology that were not available before that. So things I'm working on currently or the, the uh, things that are on the way. So one thing is biomineralization in nature. Again, marine plankton, then human teeth. So also path pathologies. So pr people have problems with carriers and all of that. So we try to understand what is going on there. And then also mako sharks. So other interests so with these kind of um, yeah, organisms have of course composites that are yeah, have very good microscopic properties, like very good mechanical features and all of that. We try to figure out how they can do that. So, and again, of course, after understanding all of that, we try to make hybrid materials based on similar principles and use all of that for mechanical, civil, or environmental applications. So, and also, uh, I'm a little bit interested in how to make some high performance materials, for instance, carbon nanotubes based on very simple raw materials also from nature. So in case you're more interested in all those kind of topics, so I'm always open to both undergraduate researchers, PhDs and postdocs, and also other collaborations on campus. So please contact me. No, we were looking at different ones, and we thought mako sharks are the fastest sw uh, swimming sharks of all, and they have a very interesting morphology, so their or their cartilage is very interestingly formed. So, and we thought we'd rather focus on one of them instead of doing uh, like five different sharks. <laughs> yeah. When we work with imaging of cells, uh, do you work with dead cells? <laughs> Yeah, norm so normally with dead cells, I would say, either chemically fixed ones or frozen ones. Um, yeah, so most of the times dead cells, but not always. So it's not a necessity. So if you want to say in, in, in time changes, you need different stages be somehow fixed, right? Yeah, so, but I mean, all these methods, in some cases, they are also possible for live cells, so, but not always. Yeah, it depends. 
for the synchrotron, I think you have to use dead cells normally. I mean, or frozen ones. So that's the two options. But Raman's yeah, Raman switches you, you can do with live cells. It's just that, let's say, for wood, it, yeah, you, they are always dead. That's fine. <laughs> so it's, but it's not a necessity. You can do live cell imaging as well. So, so why do I want to know what minerals are in different parts of the cell? Why? Oh, maybe you're interested in the macroscopic properties of uh, this type of organism or so. Let's say. Um, let's say often it, it depends on the orientation of the minerals, on the type of mineral, on the type of organics that are in there. So really, there are a lot of different parameters that go into that. Can you tell you about the functioning of this organism? A functioning, I mean, the, the, the functioning of that organ, yes. So let's say the functioning of our teeth will depend on our, let's say, enamel. So that's the upper part of the tooth. Uh, I think that. Yeah, the mechanical properties or the features of the enamel definitely, yeah, also tell, tell something about yeah our nutrition and so on. So let's say some animals have different uh, teeth and those kind of things. So yeah. so I would always say that the material properties and the macroscopic properties definitely have something to do with each other. So there's normally a reason for something. <laughs> and you can see some structures which look Yes, so I would say with light microscope you just get a general overview but you don't get all of those things I'm like, like yeah. yeah so let's say in just to give you an example for the teeth so let's say in red teeth versus human teeth you would see that the crystals are oriented in different ways so you would see that, uh, so if, for instance, it's very difficult to make a rat have carrier. So uh, it's very difficult. You, you always have to take bacteria from humans <laughs> to cause some carriers in there. Because their teeth are so well made <laughs> that it's hard to do, to do it. Exactly. No, no, but even if even if you give them candy, so this uh, my former colleague has done that exactly that study. So I can tell you, I can tell you that it's difficult to uh, to induce carriers in these rodents. So what is petrified wood? That's so, mineral, uh, right? so this is actually, so I d did pretty, pretty much fast forward of this type of process. So it would be like silicates that yeah, slowly diffuse into the wood structure and then preserve it. But the thing is that in this petrified wood, there's no wood left. It's just the structure that is left. So, I mean, I sometimes showed that picture just for fun, but <laughs> it's, it's definitely something else. It's not the same thing. <laughs>